All right. Good morning. How many of you guys slept well? Any of you? As, as good as you can on the ground with a rock in your back, right? Pastor Ludko was kind enough to let us borrow a cot. I have never slept on one of those in a tent, and that is a whole different experience, man. I slept like a baby, so uh, that was great. Uh, just want to say right off the bat, thank you again, gentlemen, who took the time to cook this morning, got up this morning at, I don't remember, 5.15, so I'm already out there. Can we give them a round of applause? I thought it was delicious. It was a little humbling at breakfast. We sat with one of the cooks, and my son looked at me and goes, Dad, this bacon's disgusting. It tastes like chicken. I said, Titus, you're sitting next to the guy who cooked it. And he looked at him and goes, I mean, I mean wings. It tastes like wings. And I'm, Titus, stop talking. Stop talking. So, uh, no, it was, it was delicious. Well, I do want to be thoughtful at time. I do understand. Uh, I grew up going to camp outs, and I know in the morning, uh, sitting down after a good breakfast and, and all that. Sometimes it can be a little hard. I'm going to stay moving this morning. Uh, I'm going to be thoughtful of the time. I do want to give a thought today that I, I think, uh, well, I'll tell you this. It is a new thing to me that I am learning. God is teaching me right now, and it is changing the way I go day to day in in my walk with him and really throughout what I do. And uh, I, I hope it will be a help to you. We're gonna, I'm gonna read. We're gonna look at some verses together. I'm gonna read you a few other verses. This morning, I want to talk to you about your mind. Uh, I want to talk to you about the way you think. And uh, if you will take your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter number eight. Romans chapter number eight. While you're turning there, let me just say, uh, especially to dads, um, look for opportunities today. Look, the only time God doesn't only speak to us when someone's standing up here. Uh, or when you're doing devotions, you can find opportunities throughout the day to teach your son something God is teaching you or, or learn something that God is trying to maybe reveal to us throughout the day. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter six talks about dads looking for every opportunity when thou risest up and when thou sittest down and everywhere you go and everything you do, look for opportunities to teach your kids about the Lord. And, and I really believe uh, with the whole day together out in the woods, uh, there's something about that that allows uh, God to just sometimes speak to us a little better. So um, just be thoughtful of that Romans chapter number eight. I, I want to look at two verses, one in Romans here, and then we're going to turn to Philippians chapter four, but Romans chapter eight, verse number five, it says for they that are of, uh, after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Um, I want you to look at one more verse in Philippians chapter number four. If you will, turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter four. And we're going to kind of stay there. Uh, we'll, again, we'll be bouncing around, but uh, you, could, you could turn there. Philippians chapter number four. We're going to look at verse number eight. Um, you know what? We'll start in verse seven. You guys there? Philippians chapter four, verse number seven, it says, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to read some verses. You don't necessarily have to turn there. I'm going to read some more to you real quick because I want you to see the Bible talks a lot about our minds. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity, controlling, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, a verse that especially younger kids learn pretty early and, and many of us probably have memorized. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, lean not unto thine own understanding. Uh, 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. This idea of renewing your mind, this idea of your mind being different now that you're a Christian is huge. And, and today I want to I want to talk to you about this a little bit and I want to start with the idea of understanding just how how 
uh, powerful our minds are. Um, how many of you in here are Mac guys? You use a Mac computer. Apple? Apple guys? Okay. All right. How many of you are PC? Anyone in here that, uh, yeah, anyone in here do both? Yeah. Uh, anyone else struggle with those shortcuts between the two? Man, I can never remember which one is which. Uh, anyone in here like something else like Linux or something? Okay. All right. Um, you know, computers today are powerful machines. We had a, we had a cookout for our young couples class the other day, and, and the general, uh, we had a, a guest there, and he uh, oversees the networking of the supercomputers for Pratt & Whitney and uh, was explaining just how massive this room is that has tons of computers and the, the speeds they could do and all the capabilities. You know, all the capabilities that computers do today are nothing compared to our mind. I was looking at some statistics uh, um, earlier this week and literally there are billions of cells in our minds and there are thousands of synapses or connections between them. They, they actually say that for all intents and purposes, the, the wiring of our, our computer, our brain, is um, almost uh, impossible to fathom. I mean, there's so many connections that can be made in different variations um, that travel up to almost 300 miles an hour. When we have a thought, it travels through our body to our hands or our feet or whatever, somewhere around 300 miles an hour. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. The brain has the ability to reproduce cells. Our brain never stops learning as long as there's not you know, some, some mental difficulty or something. We never stop having the ability to learn. Um, it functions at a high capacity generally all the time. Unlike our computers, you know, the fans got to kick on and keep it cooled off and all of that. Our brains, even while we're sleeping, generally run at an extremely fast and productive rate. Uh, but with that comes some serious implications. We have somewhere around, according to psychology today, 25 to 50,000 thoughts a day. Um, because all of us here are men, we probably sit towards the 25,000 thoughts a day. Um, I know my wife's always asking me, what are you thinking? And I'm like, what are you thinking about? I'm, I'm nothing. I, I don't really know, actually. <laughs> but we know that our, our minds have the ability somewhere between 25 and 50,000 thoughts a day. And scientists today have discovered that somewhere around 70% of our thoughts are negative. Somewhere around 70% of our thoughts are negative. So you take however many thoughts you have today, most of them you're going to struggle with them being negative. And if you stop to think about it, how much of our time do we spend wrestling doubts, insecurities, what ifs? And so today I want to talk to us about our mind, but I want to talk to it, talk to you about your mind, the idea of, uh, this is the thought, all right? I, I know on your notes there, you have like that key thought or the big takeaway. Here's the truth I, I want to get to today. Your life is moving towards your strongest thoughts. Your life is moving towards your strongest thoughts. You stop and consider, meditate what you're thinking about. Your life is going towards your strongest thoughts. So my question to you today is who is programming your supercomputer? Who is programming my supercomputer? What is dictating how I think and how you think? Uh, more and more science, I was reading up on this this week, and, and the, the area of neuro, uh, I forget what you call it, neuroscience, uh, the understanding of the mind, they say is one of the last frontiers for science. They're just beginning to learn how the mind works and to what capacities and what all it can do. And from a secular view, not even a biblical view or a Christian worldview, more and more scientists are discovering not only the abilities of our minds, but how important it is to think right. Uh, we, have, um, we have been uh, talking about it. I, I teach a Bible class at our school, and obviously we're in the summer right now, but we spent a lot of this year talking about how to think biblically. And, and today, I guess, here's my question. There are a lot of Christians here. I don't assume everyone here is Christians, but I'm going to assume most are. Most believe in Jesus Christ and accepted him as Savior. Uh, many of us here are Christians, but how many of us are Christian-minded? How many of us think like Christ? And so today, I want to give you some thoughts to this, but really stem from Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8 there, when it says, whatsoever things are honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtuous, and if there be any praise, think on these things. And so we have a contradiction here. 
Uh, secular psychology science tells us that 70% of our thoughts are negative, and the Bible tells us we should be thinking about good, pure, just, holy things. And so something's got to change from one to the other, and that's what I want to talk to us today, because I believe this is one discipline that if we can grab in our lives, can change the way that your day plays out and my day plays out. Uh, I was recently listening to a pastor who was talking about every year he tries to add one discipline to his life. One discipline. And it's not much in one year, but you take 20 or 30 years of adding one new discipline in your life, you'd be a different person. And one of the disciplines he was talking about was this idea of changing the way he thinks throughout the day. And so today, as a Christian, I, I want to talk to us about a discipline that we can make in our lives with our thinking. And so I really, I'm going to give you three disciplines today from, from these passages. It's a little more topical. We're going to jump into some different verses for us to understand how to change the way we think. Uh, the first one I want you to write down, first discipline we have to learn as Christians is the discipline of refusal, or, or here's another term for it, self-denial. Uh, the idea of refusal. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 5, we read a minute ago, it says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. This goes back to what we talked about last night, the question of, is God good? You know, casting down imaginations, the fantasies, the things we think about, um, so that nothing takes place higher than God. A lot of times that starts with our consideration of if God is good. But you know, in our lives, it can be, it can be a multitude of things that we let dwell our thoughts and control our actions. Again, that truth we want to look at today, your life is moving towards your strongest thoughts. And so the things that you spend the most time dwelling on is going to be the direction of your life. Gentlemen, if, if there is a temptation or a struggle with, with uh, uh, fantasizing about someone else or thinking about something else or being so determined to get to a certain place in your life. Maybe for you single men, it's getting married. Uh, maybe for, uh, for married men in here, it's just, or, or single men, maybe it's that next job promotion or, or whatever it is in our lives. Some of it can be bad things, sinful things. Some of it doesn't necessarily have to be sinful, but it dominates our mind. It's all we're thinking about. And what happens is that becomes the filter through which everything we do flows through. You know, when you're so consumed on trying to get that next promotion, you're so consumed on trying to make a name for yourself, you're so consumed on trying to get the newest or the greatest or the biggest, then everything else you do filters through that thought. How does this impact my ability to do whatever it is? And so this idea of your life moving towards your strongest thoughts, we have to first of all understand if we want to if we want to be more Christ-like in our thinking, we have to learn to refuse ourself, to refuse thoughts that come above Christ. So it talks about here in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 5, the tearing down or the, the pulling down of imaginations and bringing into captivity, staying you being the master of your thoughts, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. And so there's this idea of refusal. There's a few things that we have to refuse. We have to refuse to believe the lies. We have to refuse to believe the lies. I, I, again, I go back to the last night in Genesis chapter number three. Uh, Adam and Eve bought into the lie that God was keeping them from something that they wanted. I think of throughout scripture, different stories, David and Bathsheba or, or Saul or, or um, uh, uh, Job. I, I think of Job and his integrity when, when uh, his wife told him, hey, Job, your life is miserable, curse God and die. And you know what he told his wife? How can I do that with, from the integrity of my heart? You know what he was talking about? He was talking about bringing every thought into captivity. He wasn't going to believe the lies. You know, in our life, my life, in your life, there are so many times we lie to ourselves. It would be a fascinating study to study this sometime, and I wish we had more time, but we have an incredible ability to lie to ourselves. Our mind has an incredible ability to lie to us. And one of the things that is for certain, and I'm sure Pastor Ludka sees this all the time in counseling, and I'm experiencing this oftentimes when I'm counseling, our minds have no ability to discern the difference between reality and fantasy. We get something in our mind and we play it out and we play it out. We play it out. We have difficulty discerning between reality and fantasy. You know what? If we're going to be Christian minded, we have to learn the discipline of refusing to believe the lie. 
We have to def- def- refuse to believe the lies, the the things that Satan gives to us. And now, now we're going to get to this, but there's got to be a way to know if it's a lie, and that's going to come from knowing God's word, and that's going to become that's going to come from spending time with God, because the only way to know what's wrong is to know what's right. And so we have to learn to uh, refuse to believe the lie. We have to refuse to believe the worst. We have to refuse to believe the worst. Where do you see that? Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8 said, Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just. I also think of in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when the Bible is talking about charity or love, it says, believes all things, hopes all things. It's the idea that we are going to believe the best, maybe about other people, maybe about our own lives, but we're going to refuse to believe the worst of every situation. You know, we are, we are quick in our minds to run to anytime something goes different than how we plan for it to go to believe it's the worst. As men, oftentimes we feel and we want control of every situation. And so when God kind of throws a monkey wrench in our plans as we see it, we assume the worst. We believe the worst. Uh, when, our, when our family is struggling or when something's going on and something isn't the way exactly we want it to be, we assume the worst. Now, can I tell you a part of refusal, the ability to think and refuse or self-deny is to not believe the lies of Satan, to not believe the lies that we try to tell ourselves, but also to not believe the worst of situations. The Bible tells us here that as Christians, we should be thinking pure and right and good. Those are the things we focus on. Uh, The third thing I wrote down is the idea of refuse to believe you're a victim. Refuse to believe you're a victim. And we mentioned this last night, and and I see this throughout these verses. There's another 10 verses here I, I, I might get to, but here's the point is Proverbs 3, 5 tells us uh, not to trust ourselves, not to our own understanding. The idea of refusing ourselves, refusing the lies we tell ourselves. But the Bible also talks about the idea of um, taking into captivity our thoughts. We have the ability to control our thoughts. Now, there is a difference between um, self-help books, the idea of self-esteem and building yourself up and motivating yourself. I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. And understanding a biblical context of who you are in Christ and what you can do. I'm not talking about the idea that you just have to think harder and you have to try harder in your thinking. But there is a discipline to the Christian life of going, God, today I want to have victory over negative thoughts. I don't want to believe the lies of Satan. I don't want to believe the lies of my flesh. I don't want to believe the worst about people. God, will you allow me, will you allow me to think the right way on the situations around me? You know, a lot of times we go through life lazy. And this is what's fascinating to me, especially a group of men that, as far as I could tell, are probably hard workers and good men who desire to love God. You're here. You, you gave up a day of work. You gave up doing whatever you normally do on Friday to be here. So I know that to some degree, all of you in here want to grow in Christ. You know, a lot of us, we will be disciplined in our exercise. We'll be disciplined in our eating routines. We'll be disciplined in things that matter to us. And when it comes to our Christian life, when it comes to the way we think, the way we allow God to work through our thinking, we're lazy. It's whatever thoughts come in, we dwell on. Whatever, whatever we feel like doing, we kind of do. We, you know, it's important to us to, to disconnect and to veg and, and to do all those things. And we don't discipline ourselves to think Christ-like. We don't discipline ourselves to think about our relationship with our spouse. Or we don't discipline ourselves to think about our relationship with our children or our relationship at church or the relationships we have at work in a way that we can be Christ-like in our actions. We don't think Christ-like. And so we have to have the discipline in our lives to to refuse. And and here's what it is. Uh, This is maybe a way to ask this question. What do your negative thoughts lead to? What do your negative thoughts lead to? The things that that dwell your mind, okay? So back to that original question or the thought, your life is moving towards the direction of your strongest thoughts. What are your negative thoughts leading to? Is it leading to uh, uh, cheating on your spouse? Is it leading to not working uh, with integrity at your job? Are the negative thoughts that you have leading towards um, uh, bypassing God's way of doing things and trying to figure it out your own way? 
Is is your, are your negative thoughts leading you to self defense and protection? And you you want to um, uh, make sure people know what you can do and who you are, and trying to define yourself. And in instead of allowing Christ uh, in you to define you, what are your negative thoughts leading to? So we got to refuse those thoughts. The second thing I wrote down: uh, the Christian mind must carry the discipline of reprogramming. So not just refusal. The Bible teaches a, a principle of tearing down strongholds or bringing thoughts into captivity, but also the idea of reprogramming. Reprogramming. Uh, Psalm twenty-three, verse seven. Psalm twenty-three, verse seven. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. The way we think is what we become. And so we can't just learn to refuse the negative thoughts and refuse the, the problems, the lies, the, the worst about people, all these things. We also have to learn to reprogram our thinking. And here's what this is about. What truth can demolish my strongholds? What truth can demolish my strongholds? You know, man, all of us in here struggle with our thoughts. All of us do in different ways, in different forms. We all struggle with our thoughts. Can I tell you how you renew your mind, how you reprogram your mind? You reprogram your mind by learning the truth, learning the truth of God's word, knowing the promises in God's word and the, the things that God teaches us in his word that can help us think just and right and pure. And so reprogramming, how do you do that? You get in God's word. You get in God's word. You got to get in God's word. Um, I, I'm Pastor Ludka made these devotions for us, and I would encourage you. You didn't get a chance to do that this morning. Take some time to do that. If you got your boys here, take your time to do that with them. You know, the best way to start thinking like Christ is to know Christ. You know, I, I have uh, the privilege and have had the opportunity to work for Pastor Schmidt the last five years, and he was my youth pastor growing up. I knew him most of my life growing up, and now that I work for him, you know, I've been working for him for five years, and I'd say about 50% of the time, I get it right. About 50% of the time, I'm way off. I'm still learning. I'm, I'm still learning how to do ministry. I'm still learning how to uh, be an encouragement and a help and, and help my pastor lead. And you know what's happening, though? The more time I spend with my pastor— the more time I can think like he thinks. You know, the more time I spend with my wife, the more I begin to think like she thinks. The more I can meet her needs and the more I can understand what she, what she wants and the more I can uh, be a blessing to her and love her and cherish her because I know how she thinks. I know how she lives. But the only way that happens is by spending time with her. I've got two boys and a girl I told you about last night and, and now learning them and understanding they're not all the same. You know, Titus, is, his personality is a lot like mine and, and I could see like he's a mini me. And so it's easy for me to understand how he thinks and it's easy for me to understand probably in the future what his pitfalls will be and the, and the way his life will, will look as far as personality and traits and characters. And, you know, I have to be extra sensitive with Micah. Micah's not like me. And I, I want to be sensitive to understand who he is. And so I have to spend time with him. And I have to understand how he, his little heart is developing and what his traits are. And Alana will be the same. And here's the point. The only way you get to know someone is to spend time with them. And the only way to get to think like someone is to know them. And so you've got to get in God's word. That's how we reprogram our minds to think right. Not only getting in God's word, but claim God's promises. Claim God's promises. Joshua 1.8 is the only time in the Bible the word success is used. And it is tied to knowing and living God's word. It is tied to knowing the promises of God. And so in your life and in my life, if we're going to have victory in our thought life, we don't just get in God's word to know him. We also begin to start claiming some of God's promises. The end of this, I'm going to share with you a, a prayer that I have begun to pray every day that God would change my thinking. Um, because I know what my strongholds are and I know what my struggles are and I want God to reprogram my thinking. And so I'm asking God to show me from his word the thoughts and the promises that I need to understand and begin to tell myself those from God's word. And in your life, the way you're going to experience victory in your thought life is knowing God's word, claiming God's promises, and then thirdly, rest in the gospel. Rest in the gospel. What do you mean by that? Well, the gospel is the common thread through the entire word of God. Every story in the Bible, everything that's in the Bible was put there. It tells the same story. That story is you and I are broken. 
We can't do it by ourselves, and we need a Savior. And every story in the Bible, every promise in the Bible ties back to what we call the gospel, the good news, and that is, in our brokenness, Jesus Christ saves us. Genesis 1.1 tells us, in the beginning, God created. We know he's a creative God. He makes things. Uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, we, we read of how Jesus on earth became a carpenter. He took warped, mangly pieces of wood and made something with them. You know, that's the exact same thing God wants to do in your life and my life. He wants to take our brokenness. He wants to take the things that are wrong. He wants to take the things that aren't exactly right and make something beautiful out of them. And so from the moment you accept Christ as Savior and for the rest of your life, God wants to take all the things that are broken in your life and make them right. And the way it starts for you and I as Christians to begin to live like Christ is to think like Christ. And so why, why do I say rest in the gospel? Because this is not about just changing our actions, although that plays a part. But it is about understanding the gospel that in Christ, coming to Christ, Christ, I need you to change my thinking. I need you to change my life. God, I know that I struggle with these thoughts, and I know that I struggle with these doubts, and I know that I have these fears. And God, these broken things I want to give to you because I know you can fix them. That's very, very different than just trying harder. In fact, that's exactly what the Bible preaches against. It's what the Pharisees did, and it's what so often we have built in our hearts. We're going to fix things ourselves. But can I tell you that the power of changing your mind rests in the gospel? And through Christ and through his work, we can deny ourselves. We can refuse to believe the lies. We can claim God's promises. And so there's refusal. There's reprogramming. And then the third word I wrote down is renewal. So God wants to uh, work in our lives to take the bad thoughts out, to reprogram us with new thoughts, and then we have to renew that day by day. Why? Because we are sinful. We are broken. Renewal. 12, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse number 1 and 2 speaks of that. Um, I know I have that verse here. Let me find it. There it is. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto, unto God, which is your reasonable service. We just read this. Look at verse number two. And be not conformed, warped, transformed, molded to this world, but be ye transformed, changed by the renewing of your mind. The only way we transform the way we look in life is by new, renewing the way we think. Why? That we may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect in the will of God. So the last one we have written down here is renewal. And here's what, here's what I want to say here. Walk with God daily. I know I already mentioned this, but walk with God daily. Why? Because number one, we know he's good. I heard a quote uh, this week. I was reading a book. I'm trying to remember what the book was. Uh, first things first. And in this book, First Things First, is talking about priorities. One of the things the author said, as he said, you will never take the prescription unless you trust the diagnosis. You'll never take the prescription given unless you know the diagnosis is right. The point being this, you'll never trust God's way of doing things, his prescription, uh, claiming his promises in your life, if you don't understand that the diagnosis, what Christ says is wrong with us, we don't, maybe we could say it this way. You'll never trust the prescription if you don't trust the doctor, right? And so in our lives, the only way we're going to trust God's way of doing things is if we know God. And so we have to understand, as we talked about last night, we have to know he's good. And secondly, we have to know that it leads to a right view. How do we know that? Romans chapter 12, verse number two says it. By the renewing of your mind that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The only way to know the good, perfect, acceptable, the goodness of God that we talked about last night, the plan he has for your life. The only way to know that is to spend time with him daily. And I would, I would suggest this. Now, this isn't in the Bible per se. I, I think you could probably make a case for this, but start your day off with God. Start your day off with God. Look, we're, we're under grace. We can spend as much time or as little time as we want with God, but you want to renew your mind. Can I challenge you to start the day before you have to think about all the things of the day, start your day thinking about God. Uh, why? Because we know he's good. We know it leads to a right view and we know it's the way to God's will. We know it's the way to God's will. 
Uh, oftentimes I'll have people ask, you know, how do you know God's will for your life? By knowing him. And sometimes we make God's will this ambig- uh, this uh, ethereal thing. You know, there's this mystical destiny in, in your future and you better hope to get it right. And so, you know, you kind of got to just shoot for it and, and hopefully you get it right. No, that's not God's will. You know what God's will is? It's today doing what Christ has led you to do. It says the Holy Spirit leads you to be an encouragement to this person or to stop doing that or, or to change the way you think about something or to love your spouse or to love your kids and invest in things that matter. You know what that leads to? That leads to a life that follows God's perfect will for your life. Sometimes, especially as teenagers, we think God's will is like something that we, we shoot to aim for, and, and we should. But the way you get to God's will is by doing what you know God says to do. And the way we know what God says to do is in, your, is in his word. So here's my question. What can God do through you if your thinking was in Christ? What could God do through you if your thinking rested in Christ? Our lives go the direction of our strongest thoughts. I, I told you at the end there, I wanted to share you. I, I want to share with you what, what I have been praying. I'll tell you over the last couple of weeks. As this is something God has been teaching me, and I'll tell you, it has changed the way I look at my days. Uh, since coming to Emmanuel, we've we've seen an incredible story as God has taken the church from just about bankruptcy and just about falling apart, and, and we've seen the church grow n- numerically, but more importantly, we've seen lives coming to Christ. We've seen the buildings being restored. We've been seeing the joy of Christians come back. It's been an incredible story. And I'll tell you what, as, as a pastor on the team, it has increased workload, right? Some of you work in places, somebody gets laid off or the company grows or develops or you own your own business. And so there's no day off. There's no eight to five. Uh, and, and so you understand that there's this dynamic sometimes where life just continues to get busier and busier. And you know, what's been happening in my life is I've been finding myself excusing that I'm not spending enough time with my wife and excusing that I'm not spending enough time investing in my kids and excusing the mistakes I make on work because I'm just so busy. I've been, I've been having this problem with my priorities of, of just playing the victim to, well, everything's happening to me and I just don't know how to handle it all. Do you know what that is? That's a negative thought. The Bible tells us God's not giving us a spirit of fear, but of love and a sound mind, the ability to know what to do. I, and so in my life, I've realized that in so many areas, I've been playing the victim. You know, maybe for you, it's in your marriage. Maybe, maybe your spouse isn't meeting all your needs. Maybe, you know, she's not doing all the things you thought she was going to do, or she's kind of letting herself go or, you know, whatever it is in, in your marriage that's bothering you or affecting you. You know what happens if you and I aren't careful, we'll play the victim. Well, it's who I married. It's who I'm stuck with. And you know what happens there? It leads to thoughts of, I can find something somewhere else, or I'll just deal with it, or I can handle it. And can I tell you, you have the ability, you can't change your spouse, but you can change you. And we know from God's word that God's word tells us, commands us as men to love our wives. You know what? You know the way to change your wife is to start loving her more. Not because she even necessarily loves you, loves it, but uh, I'm sorry, not because she necessarily deserves it, but because you are commanded by God to. And I've seen over and over again in my life that when somebody loves their spouse, or when a wife respects her husband, not because they deserve it, but because God commands it, the marriage gets better. But here's the point. Whatever the thoughts in your life that are negative are, get in God's word, begin to claim God's promises, and start claiming those on a daily basis. I'll tell you, I'll tell you what my strongholds are, the things that I seem to struggle with every single week. I, I wrote down insecure in my abilities. Man, I, I go through every day. I, I, 70% of the negative thoughts thing, I, I think 99% of my negative thoughts are, I can't do this. I don't know if I can do this. I, I don't, what if I get fired? What if I don't know how to do this? I, I don't know how to raise a kid in today's society. I, I don't know how to love my wife better. I, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I'm insecure in my abilities. I wrote down another one is performance-based living. I, I, oftentimes, I feel like my life is defined by what I do. The title next to my name or my capabilities or what people see in me. And, and so oftentimes I struggle with this performance-based living, which is exactly opposite the gospel. I feel like I have to prove myself and I have to prove my value and I have to prove that I'm something. 
The third one I wrote down was balanced priorities. I already shared that with you, but as life has gotten busier, I, I struggle sometimes with my priorities. I can become a workaholic or I can even check out sometimes and, and just want to play with my kids. And, and by the way, both are really important and, and they shouldn't compete and you'll always struggle to balance those two. But I know in my life, oftentimes the balance of priorities and what's most important, I struggle with those. So I want to share with you that I wrote, I wrote it out this morning. I've been praying this the last couple of weeks, like I said, and, and I tell you, it's slowly beginning to change the way I think. Here's what I wrote down. God, today I can be confident to know how to do what needs to be done, not because of my abilities, but yours. Because in your word, you say that in our weakness, you are strong. So today I'm asking that I can do something, not in my strength, but your strength through my weakness. God, my identity is not tied to my actions, but who I am in you. I'll trust in you to clarify and specify my priorities so that I can be intentional in my activities and decisions. And God, through you, I will love my wife loyally, selflessly, and purely. I'll prepare and equip my kids to use their life, their gifts, and opportunities to serve you in a greater way than they can imagine. I'll choose to live generously, authentically, and be teachable. I'll tell you, this is, this is something that I have begun to pray every single morning. Why? Because I know from God's word that he promises to be strong through our weakness. And so I don't have to go through the day going, I don't know if I can handle it all. And I don't know what to do. And I, there's just more to do today than I could possibly get done. You know what I've been doing is I've been praying, God, through your strength, I can get done today what you want me to get done. You know, I, how do I know that? Because the Bible tells me that God is sovereign. He's in control of all things. And so even though I'm not in control of that day, if I'm walking through Christ in that day, I'll get done what needs to get done. You know, when it comes to my priorities, I'll struggle all day with what should I be doing right now. But if I am trusting in Christ to guide me and to show me his priorities for my life, I won't be dictated by what will people think of me. I won't decide what priorities because, you know, how will that make me look? Because why? My, my identity is in Christ. And so I began to just pull promises from God's word and turn those into a prayer that, God, I need you to show that to me again today. And you know what's going to happen? I'm going to pray that today, and I'm going to pray that tomorrow, and I'm going to pray that the next day, and renewal is going to start to take place. Uh, I had the opportunity this morning to meet a gentleman who works for Academy, this, this uh, uh, shooting facility up the road. Uh, we were talking last night with a couple guys about uh, a shooting facility we use where we live. And, and you know, I, I've really taken up the hobby. I enjoy shooting, and it's, it's a fairly new thing uh, for me. And, and I've been uh, practicing every single day. And you know what happens is as you begin to practice over and over and over again, it changes the way you do things. And you know what it starts with? It starts with your thinking. Uh, we, we have a security team at our church, just like you guys do. And one of the first classes we went through talked about the mindset, changing the way you think. Um, and, and, you know, that was for something like security at our church. But I'll tell you this, uh, people who don't know Christ and the secular world understands the power of the mind. That's why there's a whole category at the bookstore about self-help, how to change the way you think. Think positive about yourself and self-esteem. The problem is the truth isn't necessarily wrong. The, the, the prescription is. The prescription can only be found in Christ. And so when you and I begin to change the way we think and renew it day by day by day, you're going to find that you and I have a greater ability to make Christ-like decisions. So I hope that'll be a help to you this morning. Uh, I'm going to have a quick word of prayer and then just give a silent moment for you to, to have a word of prayer with the Lord. Let, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. God, there are countless passages where you talk about the power of the mind. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Our, our greatest thoughts direct our lives. And so, God, if that is true, and, and according to your word it is, then the greatest thoughts we must have must be the ones you give us. Lord, we need to live a life where we are thinking purely and just and right and towards your will and towards your way and understanding your goodness. So in the quietness of this moment, gentlemen, I want to ask that you just take a moment and think about this. What is, what is my greatest negative thought? And maybe you're a new Christian and, and, and you still maybe need help with this, but I want to ask you to think about your greatest negative thought and then think about a promise from God's word that can give you victory over that.
And if you need help with that, see Pastor Ludker, see myself or one of the assistant pastors here today. We'd love to help you find promises from God's word that can help you experience the right kind of thinking. And so in just the quietness of this next minute, I'm going to just a minute, just leave a minute here in quietness. I want you to think about God, what, what needs to change in my thinking so that I'm thinking like Christ. I'm going to close us in prayer in just a second.